Good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to introduce you to our fourth speaker in our speaker series, World Perspectives, um, Takashi Yamashita. Takashi uh, was born in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and comes from a Japanese-Canadian Scottish background. He's worked as an architect, educator, real estate financer, community volunteer, and entrepreneur. His diverse background has informed his belief that a bold, varied, and pluralistic perspective is an important factor in making an impact on one's environment. In addition to several major Canadian cities, Takashi has lived and worked in London, Berlin, and Las Vegas. So it's my pleasure to introduce him to you this morning, and I'm sure you'll really enjoy his talk. Thank you. I'm an architect, um, that's the environmental studies, did my master's at the University of Manitoba, worked in Winnipeg for about 10 years, was very fortunate to have a great client, Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade, so on the little image on the left, that's in London, England on Trafalgar Square, we did the refurbishment of Canada House, which is an historic project, so you're, that's open to the public, um, and that was a big restoration work, very interesting little project. Uh, then I did an MBA, after 10 years of working as an architect, decided to go back to school. My parents uh, are big fans of education, and so am I, so, uh, and that comes in different ways, formal and, and informal. And then I decided to take an MBA full-time in, in Toronto, that's when I moved here. And then shortly after that, I was working in a private equity t company, which is basically saying private private money, and this uh, one individual had some projects in Las Vegas, so I had to live in Las Vegas for about three years. Uh, I originally grew up in Colorado as well after being born in Winnipeg, so it was interesting being back in the United States, that's for sure. Um, and it's a phenomenal city to go there, because I'd never been there, and you're not sure what to experience. And there is life there other than casinos and things like that, but uh, it was a fantastic place to kind of experience that part of the world. And then after that, I came back to Canada. And I've um, worked at GE Capital for about eight years, uh, being a pretty much putting the design side on the side away, and then actually turning on the financing hat. So I financed about $2.8 billion of commercial real estate across Canada, which was a completely different way of looking at brick and beams versus the architect way. And then now I'm, I've put that all aside, and now I've, uh, a partner of mine, um, Daniel uh, Colbert, and I, we decided let's start a company, and now we're back to ground, you know, step one again of just trying to, to start all that going. So it's very much back in the entrepreneurial space and so forth. And we specialize in, in basically doing buildings about where everybody is happier and works better, that kind of, that kind of concept. So the new, the, the Canada never had an embassy in Berlin. They only had it in Bonn. They had a, they had they rented an office space when 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 Berlin was reamalgamated, and they said finally at at that time the minister Lloyd Axworthy said I like to get that site on this historic area. Well, we always had this vision of like well if we're if we're building the embassy here what should we do, and we always this is dip, this is diplomatic kind of design we said well where's the Reichstag like where's where's that where's where's the most where's Brandenburg gates like where where all the symbolic, where would CNN go, all these kind of things. So we, we recognize that we had a, the site is excellent because it has this unique view to the city. And here's an interesting constraint to work around. So then the, the German the city planner said, your building is going to look like this. And they, they said, this is your building. So like, it's quite interesting as architects or designers or you think you want to be creative in your life, it says, well, here's what you do. And someone just said, no, no, you're, this, this is what your building is going to look like. So they said, because we want, we want our cities to be recalling our old city. And so this is where the massing is going to be. So there it is. And so you think, well, interesting design. You know, and now we've got to figure out what to do with those very big constraints. So what we first thing we did is we said, you know what? We're going to bring over almost all the finishing materials from Canada. We're shipping it all over. So on the left is Manitoba Tyndall Stone. From Ontario, we brought over Aramosa's limestone. From Quebec, we got granites. Uh, and limestones, and we did all these Canadian woods. We said, all right, we're going to clad this whole building, every finish you see, with Canadian materials. Because that's what an embassy should be. Even though a part of this building was so big, we're going to have third-party condos in it and things like that. It's like, no, no, no. If this, otherwise, let's just rent. Otherwise, go buy a building. If, but if you want identity, start finding a way to have expression of that. And so the Canadian government, good on them, they said, yep, we're, we're backing you. We're, we're going to believe it. Because it's not going to cost more whether you ship something from Italy or ship it from India. Like you're, it's, 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 kind of a, it's kind of the same cost. And the point here, it really, not as much the design of the product, but really the way of getting there 
you know, in our, my experience is, as whatever great ability you have, you're, you're very lucky to be in a great team. And so we had a very diversified team. This is just the Canadian team of it, and there's some, there were some extraordinary people uh, that I was had the privilege of working with. So, the, so we have these little, there's a, these little artifacts called a Dadama doll, which is really like a wishing doll. So it's pretty simple. You make a goal, and, 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 and the concept is with these things is think big. Don't, don't think a goal like I want to clean up my room. Unless you have a really messy room, then that may be a big goal. But the point is, you make a goal, and then you, when you achieve the goal, you would kind of fill in the other eye. And you go, well, there I go. So I am now reminded of my achievement. But in the reality of achieving goals, right, this is the point with all these hard efforts and so forth. There's, there's the, what, I what I've come to recognize is that the, setting a goal is, is, takes a lot of work. You, you, you want to set a noble, high, good, good, good guiding goal. But the thing is, as they start going, and pardon the, my feeble shots here, is the filling in of the other I is not so easily done. It's really a philosophical driven goal, uh, a humanitarian goal, but the actual tactic of achieving results involves enormous persistence. It involves a lot of luck. And you can see in this slide number four, like sometimes you get a setback. Oh my God, this thing has gone back. You know, it used to be, and then, then you get going again. Oh, you think you got your things accomplished. And you go right back to step one again. And so the, these wishing dolls, if you call them that, are, are meant to be concept about um, persistence. It's not about setting a goal. Sure, set a great goal, but persist to achieve it. That's what these things are about. I just wanted to show you some projects that are like, how do you actionalize the things you're passionate about, how they're hard to do, how they're worth doing, and how you do them in teams. Okay, thank you.